Welcome back to our lecture discussing the aircraft routing problem. In the previous video lecture, we have seen what is this problem about and how to formulate it using an MLP model. In this lecture, we're going to discuss an alternative approach. We're going to discuss dynamic programming methods to address not only the aircraft routing problem, but together also to solve the timetable design problem and eventually to help us with our fleet decisions. Let's first look into the background, why dynamic programming could be a solution for us. So we saw in our last video that our aircraft routing problem can be formulated as a set partitioning problem, where the difficulty comes that we have to generate all the possible routes before solving the aircraft routing model. And to compute all these routes can be tricky, especially if we are dealing with a large timetable and if you want to address multiple days in a single route. Furthermore, this problem can be seen as a dynamic network problem. And why is that? Well, it is dynamic because we are trying to solve the problem over time and it is over a network over space that we are trying to define our routes. So a good alternative solution is dynamic programming. This was a method that was developed by Richard Bellman in the 1950s, but the, the interest on this technique has increased in the last decades due to his use in the reinforcement learning algorithm, which is sometimes also called an approximate dynamic programming algorithm. This is a machine learning technique in which we teach an agent, the computer, to make decisions based on the context that we are experiencing. But what is in fact dynamic programming? Well, well, it is a mathematical technique that is very useful to solve problems in which we have to make sequential and interrelated decisions. It follows a divide and conquer concept in which we divide our full problem, a large problem, into a set of incremental steps recursively solved to obtain a solution to our large problem. And these steps are usually set problems which are trivial to solve. And if you combine all these solutions together, we get the full solution to our large problem. But this method cannot be applied to all problems. So we need to verify that our decision process is Markovian. And what does this mean? It means that the environment is fully observable, that we know what is the current state in which we are. But it also means that future decisions and rewards, so costs and benefits, will only depend on the states in which we are. They do not depend on past decisions. And if these properties are observed, we can follow the principle of optimality as defined by Bellman, which states that an optimal policy has a property to remain the optimal policy regardless of what was the initial state and decision that we have made. That means that our policy does not depend on previous decisions. And what is this policy? It's a set of rules that define what to do according to the current state. And what is state? Well, state is the current situation of the system, of the problem that we are trying to solve, including all the information that we need to characterize the state in which we are. And once we know the state, and once we have the policy, the policy allows us to define our decisions, that is, the action that we need to take to influence our system, our problem, what we are trying to solve. To understand dynamic programming in a more tangible way, let's follow an example given in the book from Ilier and Lieberman, The Introduction to Operations Research. So we do have here uh, a network, and we want to solve the problem of finding the shortest path from a node A to a node J. The first thing we're going to do is to define our reward function. And that's the function F, which depends on the state, Sn, and the decision that we're going to take, Xn. So it's the total cost of the best overall policy at a given state, given decision that we're going to make. And it depends on the immediate cost at stage N, and costs in the future, so the minimum future cost that we may experience in the future, so from the stage n plus 1 onwards. And this can be defined according to this expression that we do have here, in which we do have the total cost as being equal to the contribution of the present state, given the action xn, and the minimum total cost of the future steps, of the future stages. And to understand this, we can define stage 1 as being only A node, stage 2 moving one node ahead, so it's B, C and D, stage 3 being E, F and G, and so on. And we do have costs associated with each one of our actions, and actions are described here according to the arcs. And we have stages, so each action will make us move from one state, for instance A, to state B. And to do that, to go from state A to state B, I have a cost of 2. But how can I solve this? So if we look into our total cost function, we are saying that the total cost function in a given state and given a given action 
is the cost of the current state plus the cost of future states. That is the minimum cost that we'll experience at stage n plus 1, at stage n plus 2, n plus 3, and so on, until we get to the end of our network. But we don't know these future costs. So if I am in a state n, I don't know what will be the cost in n plus 2. So the traditional approach to solve this problem is to start from the end and moving backwards. So in our case, it's simple. We have no j, and we know that the cost in no j is zero. So the cost of going from j to j is zero. I'm already there. So I'm going to progress backwards, and I'm going to see, okay, what will be the cost of going to j if I look into h? And there is a cost of 3 for this action, so I know that h will have a cost of 3. For i, I know it's 4. Well, and for f? Well, for f, it's either 3 plus 6 or 4 plus 3. So 4 plus 3 is 7, which is lower than 6 plus 3. So I'm going to take that the minimum cost for f is 7, and the path to go to j will be f i j. And I do this for all the nodes in my network until I get to A. So if I do this to all my nodes until I reach A, I do have a map of the cost of the full network. And now I can make my decisions. So now I can find my shortest path from A to J. And to do that, I need to follow a greedy policy, in which I'm always going to take the decision that minimizes my cost. So starting from A, I have three options. Either I go to B, to C, or to D. If I start with B, I have a cost of 2 to get to B, plus the minimum cost from B onwards. And that's the value of being B and moving to E, or to F, and to G, and all the future costs. But I already have this minimum F value, and this is 11. So I can replace here and have 2 plus 11 equal to 13. If I do the same process, I can see that these two other options will give me a total cost of 11. That's exactly the cost that I estimated for A. So I can either go to C, or to D. Both options are optimal. And this is where I can build the shortest path not only from A to J, but in fact from all the nodes of my network to the node J. Okay, we have learned what is dynamic programming and how it can be solved. But the question is, how can we use this method to solve our aircraft routing problem? Let's see this problem with six airports, in which we do have our hub airport in Amsterdam. We're going to operate only flights to and from our hub. And we do have information of demand per day between all ODI pairs. And to make it interesting, this problem, we're going to divide this demand per day into demand per hour. So we do have all these coefficients, depending on the airport that we are operating from, that tell us what is demand at each hour of the day. So for instance, to obtain the demand between Amsterdam and Frankfurt, we have to multiply these 582 passengers that want to travel with us per day by 0.0991 to know how many passengers want to fly at 5 a.m. And this will give us a distribution of our demand over the day. We have also information about our fleet. So we do have three aircraft of type 2 and two aircraft of type 3. We have the characteristics of each aircraft type provided also in this table. And what we want to obtain is the best timetable and the aircraft routes for our problem. And we have to respect that each aircraft will start and end their daily routes at the hub, that we are only going to fly from the hub to the spokes and from spokes to the hub, as previously said. There are no connections at the hub, so passengers are not connecting at the hub, and we are going to consider only direct demand in our flights. But we are going to assume that passengers are willing to adapt their flight times by a maximum of two hours. That is, if we define a specific moment in which our flight will departure, we can consider that the demand for that flight is not only the demand of that hour, but also the demand of the two hours before and two hours after that flight hour. All the demand that goes beyond this attraction band is not considered for that flight. We also need to discretize our day to be able to apply dynamic programming. And we're going to do that by discretizing our 24 hours into time segments of 6 minutes. That is, 10 segments per hour. So this is a problem. And now we're going to solve it. Okay, the proposed approach is described in this full chart. So we start by pre-processing all the inputs. So the demand, the cost, the fleet characteristics. And then we're going to divide our problem in sub-problems. So we're going to solve the route problem 
for aircraft type 1 given the input and obtain the optimal solution which will give us the optimal route and schedule because we have flight times allocated to our flights, the profit and demand serve if we choose aircraft type 1. And we do the same for aircraft type 2. We use dynamic programming to solve the routing problem and we obtain the same information including profit. We can compare the profit from both aircraft types and choose the one which has the highest profit. If that profit is positive, we save the route and we continue if we still have aircraft left in our fleet. And if we still have aircraft left in our fleet, we remove the demand transported in the previous route and we resolve the problem again for aircraft type 1 and for aircraft type 2. And we repeat this iterative process until either both aircraft types do not provide us with a profitable route or if I don't have any aircraft left anymore in my fleet. Let's see now how I'm going to use dynamic programming to solve the routing problem for each aircraft type. So in this slide I do have a very simple representation of our problem. I do have only three airports and I'm discretizing our 24 hours into time segments of 30 minutes. I also assume that our day starts at 6 a.m and I do have the initial three hours of the day in the left hand side and I do have then the last hours of the day in the right hand side. So as I explained to solve dynamic programming, we're going to solve from the end. So I do know that at the end I need to be at my hub in Amsterdam with a profit of zero. That means that after this moment I can no longer make any profit, I cannot fly anymore. And then I have to represent all flight possibilities. I do have ground arcs here in green, that represents the option of staying on the ground, and actually I do have that for all airports. I'm not representing the arcs here on the left hand side because otherwise it would be too complex and just a repetition of what we see here on the right hand side, but imagine that the arcs are there as well. And I do have the flight arcs in blue if they go to the hub and in red if they come from the hub. And you can see that I don't have to represent all states in the Frankfurt and Madrid uh, airports because there are no longer be options here to fly back to our hub and still get there before the end of the day. In a synthetic way, I'm assuming here half an hour flight from Frankfurt and I'm assuming one and a half hour flight from Madrid to Amsterdam. So I've, I'm here in the last time segment. I have two options to move to the previous time segment. Either I stay on the ground or I come from Frankfurt to Amsterdam. So if I stay in Amsterdam, I continue having a profit of zero. If I fly from Frankfurt, because potentially I don't have much demand, I have a negative profit, so I have costs. And from there, I move to the next time segment. Now, if I stay in the ground, I still have a profit of zero. And if I'm in Frankfurt at this moment in time, and I have a cost and I have a profit that is equivalent to the minimum of flying from Frankfurt back to Amsterdam at half past 10, or to stay in Frankfurt and then flying from Frankfurt to Amsterdam at 11 p.m. Apparently I do have more demand at 10.30, so I still make a loss if I fly at 10.30, but it's lower than if I fly at 11, so I store the information about the cost of flying at 10.30, that's minus 40. And then I move to the next time segment. And I can see here that if I'm in Amsterdam at 10, I can move from Amsterdam to Frankfurt and then back to Amsterdam and I make a profit that pays back this loss that I'll experience by being in Frankfurt at half past 10. And this profit is 10 and that's what I store here. But if I'm in Frankfurt at the same time, I can eventually make more profit. So I can make 30 monetary units of profit by flying from Frankfurt to Amsterdam at 10. I have now states in Madrid as well, but this doesn't bring profit to me. It brings a loss of 100 monetary units. It's also time to explain what I'm doing here with this control array at the bottom. What I'm storing here is information to where I need to go if I'm staying at the hub airport at that moment in time. And this is important because if I want to capture this profit that I'm seeing here, I need to check to where I need to go to get this profit. But if I store here in this control matrix, I don't have to check that once more. So what I'm saying here is that if I want to get these 10 monetary units, I need to fly to Frankfurt while in the following time steps, the best option is to stay in Amsterdam. And then I'll continue moving backwards, computing all the profits for each node in my network until eventually I get to the beginning of the day. And by doing this, I do have my map of profits 
for being in each state of my network. The network represented the time space possibilities for my uh, routing problem. And by doing so, I already know what is the profit I'm going to make with this hypothetical uh, aircraft type. Because I do have information that if I'm at the beginning of the day, in this case at 6 a.m., at my hub airport, where I need to be, because that's something that I know, I'm going to make a profit of 2,870 monetary units. And that's exactly the profit of using this fleet type. So what I need to do now is to follow the max profit path from my initial node to my end node, following this greedy policy in which I'm going to always fly or stay in the ground according to what brings to me the most profitable option. So I start here at my node in Amsterdam at 6 a.m. I'm going to look into my control array and it says that I should fly to Frankfurt if I want to have this profit. So this is what I'm going to do. And once I am in Frankfurt, I have two options. I either stay on the ground or I fly back to Amsterdam. If I stay on the ground, I'm losing money. So I need to fly to Amsterdam. And by being in Amsterdam, I go again to check my control array and I see that I need to fly to Frankfurt. So I do that again. And if I stay in Frankfurt, I'm losing money, so better to fly back to Amsterdam. And if I'm in Amsterdam, I have the information that I should remain in Amsterdam. Apparently, there is no demand to fly neither to Frankfurt or to Madrid. So I stay in Amsterdam. And I do that until I get to my final node and I have the full route to my aircraft. And this is my route in the morning. And eventually I get to the afternoon, being in Madrid, flying back to my hub and then going to Frankfurt, arriving at my hub at half past 10 and then staying in Amsterdam until the end of the day. Please remember that this is Markovian decision process as it's needed to apply dynamic programming approach. And why is that? Because we make our decisions from stage to stage, having the full information about our system, about our problem and having the optimal action and reward, so the profit, defined regardless of what was the actions and states that we visited before in previous time steps. For instance, if I'm here at this stage, Amsterdam at 7 a.m., my decision to go to Frankfurt is optimal regardless if I came from Frankfurt in the previous time segment or if I stayed on the ground in Amsterdam since 6 a.m. In any case, this will be the optimal decision at this moment and the profit I can make is this uh, 2,390 monetary units. And this is my final route and schedule for this aircraft type, according to this greedy policy in which I'm trying to get the highest profit path. And if I do this for all aircraft types in this iterative approach that I explained in the previous slide, I'll end up having my solution, which for the problem that we discussed with the hub in Amsterdam, will give me a profit of almost 30,000 euros per day. And I do have the aircraft for all my five aircraft of my fleet. Here I'm representing only the solutions for the first three aircraft. And I can see here that I have the flight time. So I do have the, the timetable designed according to my solution. I do have the passengers that I'm transporting, the load factor of each flight and the profit I'm making each flight. Notice that some flights may result in a negative profit, but by flying to the spoke and back, so the sum of both flights, it ends up by being positive. I have the same for aircraft 2 and aircraft 3. So this is the type of solution that we're going to obtain. Okay, we have solved the aircraft routing problem together with the time design problem using dynamic programming. But what is the challenge of using dynamic programming? Is it better or worse than the mixed integer linear programming that we discussed in the previous video lecture? And what is the computational challenge of solving a problem using dynamic programming in a traditional way? Can you think about it? I leave to you to think about it and to bring discussion to our Q&A sessions or to the comments below in this video. What I can say to you is that this dynamic programming approach is associated with the well-known three courses of dimensionality, meaning the state space, the outcome space and the action space, which can be used for some problems and really hard to solve if possible at all. Curious about it? Would you like to know more? So check literature on the approximate dynamic programming or reinforcement learning. A good reference is the book from Warren Paul, Approximate Dynamic Programming, Solving the Course of Dimensionality. If you learn this, we can eventually apply dynamic programming to solve large-scale problems in a smart way. I will leave you with this challenge, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Bye-bye.